Breath of Fire 3, items only. Can it be done? Yes, should it be done? No, why did I do it? It's a great question. So, what are the rules? Well, it's an items only run, so no attacking, no dragon transformations, no abilities, including stealing, that's a sin. Basically, no using anything that isn't an item command in and out of battle. I will allow the characters to use examine or defend solely to burn turns, but that's it. Oh boy. Naturally, the dragon tutorial at the beginning isn't subject to these rules, because they're not real battles, but the second we escape the mine, it's game on. Before we get into the meat, there's a minor issue I have to factor in, which is the reprisal mechanic. Reprisal is a fancy word for counter, and every character has their own individual rate at which they'll slap back. Ryu is a mandatory party member throughout the entire game, and his reprisal rate is 12%, but I'm going to try to mitigate any significant damage by keeping his power pathetically low. The other rates are Gar at 16%, Peko with a whopping 50, and Ray with a lowly 6. But Nina and Momo are the saving grace of this run and have absolutely no chance to counter ever. A big fat zero. This means they'll be my active party for the entire game, barring the small chunk where they're not available. Any character subbed in place of these two will have such pathetic attack values that it won't matter much anyway, and if they do too much damage with counters, I'll just reset until I get a clean run. Is everything clear? We understand? Good, let's begin. Once we're in control of Ryu, I run around and clean up what I can from field maps and various cabinetry, and also exploit a little trick we're going to use a couple times, where a nearby pond features an unlimited amount of croc tears for any mad lad crazy enough to mash X for 5 minutes. You can carry 99 of every item, and these sell for 2 zenny each. Fucking rolling in it. A useful trick is we're going to need a shitload of money, because every attack is going to cost at least 10 zenny. The only damaging item available at this point is a Molotov, which costs exactly that. This means that I'll have to run from almost every random encounter until I can secure an enemy that pays out more than I spend killing them, which uh, is not many. Anyway, that doesn't really matter right now, because with the croc tier exploit, I scrape up about 50 Molotovs and head to fight the new, the first major boss. He's weak to fire, so a Molotov will do anywhere from 18 to 26 damage, and both his forms have a collective 500 health, so 50 cleared him easily. You might be wondering what dictates item damage, and good on you for contributing, because I had the same question. Believe it or not, items aren't really items in Breath of Fire 3, they're more of a means to cast a spell without using AP. Instead of a Molotov doing damage as a gas-filled glass bottle, by using one it effectively casts the basic fire spell Flare for free. Or for Tenzeni, I guess. Since magic scales with intelligence, I performed the definitive test by modding a different save to give me the maximum intelligence we could truly see the effect on item use. Given standard resistances and about 30 intelligence, a Molotov will do 10 to 15 damage in the starting areas. With 999 intelligence, a Molotov did a whopping 120 damage to a regular foe. This is big. Now, here's where it gets a bit unconventional and I start killing kids who don't deserve it. I mean, maybe they do, depends on your perspective, really. During the new fight, I intentionally kill off my two small boys to keep them at level 1, and this is because Breath of Fire 3 has a master system. Any playable character can apprentice under these guys to influence differing stat increases as they level, and right after the new, a magic fella becomes available. The two or three levels I would have gained with vanilla stat increases will now be weighted to intelligence, which might net me an extra point or two of damage. Now that might not seem like it's worth it, but for the rest of the game, every single point of damage is gonna matter, and that is not hyperbole. I blew all my new money on healing and molotovs and shuffled on over to the master, Mygus. My gas? His requirement for apprenticeship is to give him all your money, so I emptied the pockets, coughed up my whole one zenny, apprenticed the three boys under him and got Ryu and Tipo a couple levels to boost that intelligence. At this point, I'm rocking 99 molotovs, the only item I can buy that deals damage. Unfortunately, the next area features seven bosses in a row, about half with high fire resistance and no chance to stock up between. Based on a previous run, I know for a fact that 99 mollies is not enough, which means the run's dead. Thanks for watching. I'm gonna go do some fishing to cope with this. But wait, fish in this game are usable, like items, and can have effects, such as casting flare just like molotovs, and luckily for us, that's exactly what puffers do. There's a fishing spot just near the starting town which features puffers, and I'm gonna catch the entire population of them. About 50 should do. In this time, I also caught around 60 or 70 piranhas, which bulked the coffers a bit, and will future-proof me for what's to come, because if, if you thought fishing for three hours was rough, you haven't played Breath of Fire 3. Actually, come to think of it, if you haven't played this game, what the fuck are you still doing watching this video? Go play it! So now that we've got 99 molotovs, 50 odd puffers, and another wind damaging item, the weather vane that I picked up from a prior map, we're gonna try to string the seven bosses in a row. Let's uh, pray for good damage rolls. 
Before we head off though, let's kill Ray and Tipo, you know, with Molotovs of course, and pump Ryu up a little bit for a couple more intelligence points. Oh yay, me friends are fucking dead. Rushing to the manor, I clean up the dog with around 20 Molotovs, and as the chicken's weak to fire, he goes down with another 10. Ray and Tipo die in the first fight, and Tipo alone in the second, so Ryu's getting a bunch of experience funneled his way. Oh, and if you don't know, experience is divided into however many party members are alive. Probably should have said that before. Anyway, we grab a firecracker, a stronger fire damaging item, and head inside. Ray splits from the party at this point, but it doesn't matter, so we keep on chugging, and I try to keep Tipo as dead as he can be without playing too risky. There's big groups of sporadically dangerous enemies, a bunch of shit to loot, and running isn't exactly guaranteed, so this part's a little bit sketchy. I had a few close calls, but overall it was a clean run. Or walk, if you run the encounter rate increases. The main mentions are shit I can sell, and a taser, which is an attack item that does lightning damage to everyone. I grab a magic shard, usually an extremely useful item as it permanently increases your AP by one, but I won't be using AP at all in this run, so I can cash those in for a couple extra bucks. There are four uninteresting ghost bosses in here, and two are resistant to fire, so by the end of it all I've got 18 molotovs remaining, and I burnt through my weather vane and taser on the fire resistant ghosts. That's six bosses down, and with my mollies, 50 or so puffers, and a firecracker, the only obstacle in my way is Amalgam, this giant blobby ghost boss. But this starts off pretty well, we exhaust the molly stack and start chipping away at puffing him to death, 10 damage at a time. The firecracker does a whopping 45 damage, which is about 10% of his total health, and you know, it's not wholly necessary, but this is going to be a long run, so saving turns where I can, it's going to help keep me sane. Around halfway in, he starts using a technique called Astral Warp much more frequently, and this can two-shot any of my boys. Except for Tipo, who can't even take one hit, and he gets clapped. This might seem bad, but it actually puts me in a rhythm where I can't lose. You see, son, Ray goes before Amalgam, so he can outheal the damage to either himself or Ryu. Ryu goes after Amalgam, so he needs a healer to be able to deal damage. Ray heals whoever took damage the turn prior, and Ryu continues chipping away, throwing inflatable fish at a collaboration of spirits. The battle's free at this point, as I have enough healing herbs and a decent excess of fish. However, at one point, Ray counters for 20 damage, and that shits me a little bit. While it didn't make a difference to the outcome, I still make an effort to burn two puffers as a symbolic gesture of a pure, honest victory. And just like that, we've wiped the seven boss gauntlet and get to make progress. I unequip Ray and Tipo, because they're not going to need their gear in hell. I mean, they might, but I'm taking it anyway, and we get our anuses prolapsed by two studly anthropomorphic horses. I know some of you freaks are into that. Now, it's on to Windia, with Ryu, alone. Scaling Mount Mjörnig, we grab an Icicle, a frost-based item far more powerful than a mere Molotov. We get a Protein for a permanent increase to defense, which we'll, uh, we'll need, and a Bat Amulet. This accessory prevents blind, and it's often quite handy, but items aren't subject to blind, so that's free money. This area features nut troops and nut mages who are free battles. They each die to one molotov and drop 16 zenny, which is a molly and a half. The troop has a small chance of dropping a broadsword, which sells for 300 zenny, and the mage has a 100% chance of dropping a molotov, so you don't even have to restock if you just focus on mages. We find Balio and Sunder, get our spine adjusted, and narrowly avoiding the grave, end up in Windia Prison, only to hook up with the princess and make our escape through the grave. Push some switches, rob some dead people, you know, standard JRPG business, then we come out the other side, relatively unscathed, on to Windia City. The stores here are the first to sell attack items that aren't Molotovs, and are significantly stronger. We've got Dynamite, which is an Earth attack, and we've already been over what Weather Veins and Tasers do, but now, we can buy them. I'm not gonna bust my load just yet though, as they sell them way cheaper down the road. I also strip Nina's accessory that revives her once upon death. Her life isn't worth 1500 zenny, but... 1500 zenny is worth 1500 zenny. Then, after getting some new armor and stocking up on Molotovs, we get recaptured by Balio and Sunder. Oh no! Being tied up behind a bar, Bitem bites through the ropes and we're off to freedom, but not before Nina pays us a little compliment for our strong teeth. It's in the name, baby. We gotta get out of Genmel fast, but before we go, there's a secret fishman in the corner who gives you a flyer, granting access to a 20 to 30% discount on all items in the town for the entire game, and you can only get it right now. If you miss it here, it's gone for good, and given how tight money's about to become, we are gonna need that. But this drops the price of the stronger attack items from 200 zenny to 140, which is huge, as there's a notoriously difficult boss fight just across the bridge, and I'm gonna need as many attack items as I can muster. The next mountain is easily scaled, with a handful of goodies to grab along the way, then there's some story shit, and we arrive at the tower. 
This part is significant for two reasons. One is the fishing spot outside, and the second is for all the good shit we can sell inside. Also, Momo's here. The fishing spot features octopuses, who, when used as an item in battle, will cast blind on every foe. I may need these for a later event, so I'll grab about 20 or so, and any excess can be sold for a hefty profit of 150 zenny a pop. Now, the tower itself is full of encounters I'm not gonna fight, because I want to keep Nina and Momo as low as possible for their eventual master, Yggdrasil, who I need a wisdom seed to apprentice under. A puzzle at the base of the tower grants you three items based on how fast you complete it. A multivitamin, a wisdom seed, and a ring of ice. You gotta ping a crystal, and then are given 30 seconds to run outside, ping four more crystals, and depending on your time remaining, you're given an item. I always slip up on this, but I only fucked it up a couple times. Everything went better than expected, and I got my rewards. Well, going up the tower's boring, so let's skip over it. Then we stop at a coffee shop to buy molotovs from the... coffee store? Huh. And then it's on to the plant. We share a deep, profound conversation about the ethics of sentient onions, and then shuffle on over to where they throw said onions into a pool of lava. Nice. The loot in this place bulks the coin purse. We fight a boss weak to fire, he kills Nina, and we head over to our new master, Yggdrasil. As we can't return to the starting town to access Migus, Nina and Momo will have to do it under this tree. Iggy has similar stat increases to Migus, but you lose slightly more power and HP and gain a tiny bit of defense. It's not an ideal solution for Nina, because she's already got low HP, and I don't want Ryu to lose his HP gains, but that point of defense is nice. Now we can get recaptured by Balio and Sunder, taken back to the arena, and start our power leveling, because the next few bosses are absolutely brutal in an item-only run. This is legitimately one of the hardest points when you've only got items, and honestly, kind of in the base game too, this whole area is a major casual filter. Right now, the name of the game is getting as much money as possible and stacking my inventory full of damaging items that aren't molotovs. Selling all my shit, I've got about 7,000 zenny and there's a sneaky way to make a quick 5 grand more. There's a semi-obscured master we can access after this zone, who will apprentice us only if we find her lost medallion, which needs to be shaken down from this tree. I don't need her for this run because her stat gains are pathetic and I can't use any of the moves she teaches anyway, but her medallion sells for 5,000 zenny. Watching me sell these stat upgrade and AP recovery items would uh, probably send a Breath of Fire veteran into shock, so let's enjoy that for a sec. Yeah, yeah, that's enough. I grab 40 dynamite and 20 weather veins and go do a little leveling because my guys are pathetically weak. I can't buy molotovs here, the last spot I could purchase them was the coffee shop, which I can't access for a while, so I have to be careful about how I use these items. In random fields nearby are gangs of nut enemies who all die to one molotov, so I'll chop through a decent amount of those to fund my expensive taste for weather veins. But these can take care of groups of three electric enemies, which yield a fair whack of experience and have a chance of dropping tasers, another decent attack item. For a standard run, I reckon your characters would be about level 13 or 14 at this point, and probably not apprenticed under a magic growth guy, so they'd be a bit physically beefier. I got bored and stopped at around 12, I tried my luck at the arena and got fucking roasted. The current story beat is that we've got to beat a three round arena. The first features a relay fight of sorts, where you stand over fire as a charred bloke holds you up. I don't... I don't think that's racist, I'm pretty sure God just burnt him. You can either battle the foe atop the pillar man, or take him out and drop your opponent into the lava. Dropping foes is the best strat, but it's not super viable in this run due to the sausage man's high fire resistance and huge health pool. The alternative is to beat the three team members in a 1v1 scenario, which is significantly harder than it sounds, because they've all got their own little tricks. Sneaky, sneaky tricks. The first foe, Claw, isn't too hard. She has some fairly weak attacks and can be blinded pretty easily. The second bloke, Rotundus, buffs himself for a few turns and has a random chance of casting fairly low level spells, but they do a decent chunk of damage. He's not a huge issue, you might lose like one character, but he's fine. This absolute dog shit pain in the ass motherfucker is the one-eyed sword idiot who strings crits that kill Nina in one hit and the others in two. For some reason, none of the octopuses I milked in his face would blind him. We've hit our first wall, and first, game over. I try switching up my line so that Momo goes in first, with Ryu finishing the skirmish, but he's just too weak and this bastard will not go blind. You're already halfway there, just go the extra mile. I blew through all my cash on icicles as they sell them during the tournament, and the fellas holding up our characters just so happened to be weak to ice, but uh, I was too poor to dish out the damage I needed. I'd have to heal Ryu, heal the enemy, heal my own pillar guy, and somehow find time between all that to attack, and it just... it wasn't happening. Adjusting the strats a little, I front with Nina, then follow with Momo and Ryu. My logic is, Nina can't take a single hit from the last dude, so I should start with her. 
Nina dies to a blinded claw with uh, very shitty luck, but Momo fucking champs it until the final bloke with Ryu barely finishing him off. I got so lucky in that this dude didn't string crits. He just, he just didn't crit and I won. Fair and balanced game. Now I beat all these characters with dynamite and you'd think that going into a tournament of power, the promoters or whatever would confiscate, you know, a bag of dynamite, but here we are. The next two are easy. The second fight is the Null Magic Hall, but because items aren't technically magic, they're not impacted, so this mage has to stand there and do nothing while I blast him with magic. Get fucked, nerd. Then the final match is meant to be lost, so GG. I examine once and Gar crits me for an easy one shot. We fucking did it, boys. <sighs> we fucking did it. Now, it's out of the frying pan and into Horse Cock Ranch as Stallion is up next, and after I've blown all that money on buying items, I'm not exactly liquid. My only option here is to liquidate as much as I can and do some light fishing, which nets me just enough to buy 50 dynamites, which sit alongside my 20 weather veins that went unused thus far. Horsey Boy has 1500 health, which is the highest up to this point, and the first thing he does in battle is cast a magic defense spell, reducing our damage output. Despite this, a dynamite from Ryu or Momo does just shy of 30 damage, so a full stack of 50 will do about 14 to 1500 damage depending on rolls. Weather veins are slightly weaker at between 20 and 25 damage. The best case scenario, we clear him with 20 or so items remaining, but it's gonna be close, because he also has a spell called Resist, which prevents all magic damage for one turn, and it always goes first. Even if I'm naked and speedy. In addition to this, I have to use Gar, and his intelligence is dog shit, so that'll make the battle at least a third slower, as I'll only have two attackers. Our gigantic monster friend will be my designated healer, and I gotta hope he doesn't counter too much or I'll have to reset. I immediately unequip his armor so he's agile, and also his titan belt to bring his attack down. He does one counter for 33, which is a high roll of dynamite, so I'll waste one to comp the difference, and after a long, sketchy period of this fucking C word, spam and resist, and Ryu dying, he finally goes down. I have four weather veins remaining, so we would be buggered if he didn't drop a holy mantle. This is a 1 in 64 drop and can reduce enemy encounters, but also sells for 5,000 zenny, so it's gonna help me get my money back after this part, and we've got a couple more bosses to go. I head straight back to Windia, stock up on Molotovs, and I also pick up a Midas Stone for 3,000 zenny. It's a hefty investment, but I think it'll be worth it, as it increases zenny yield by 50%, and I'm about to do a bunch of fighting back at Genmel. It's no secret that I'm a low level and have a shit stat distribution, so to counteract this, I do a little thing we Breath of Fire 3 players call, uh, breaking the game. A big issue I've encountered with the item only run is of course damage output, but that naturally leads the fight to last up to 10 times longer than it regularly would, which means my fellas are subject to much more damage. As I want to prioritize damage output, I've taken apprenticeship under magic masters who also decrease physical defense or health, making it harder again. I'll need to counter this with a master who can keep me alive, but doesn't make me too physically strong to prevent Ryu reprisaling enemies to death, and there are none better than Fal, the drunk armadillo fella behind the bar. Fal increases your HP by 4, power by 1, and defense by 3 every single level in addition to your natural stats, so he's legitimately broken. However, for this run specifically, he's not the greatest, as he also lowers intelligence by 3, as well as agility. We will only need a few levels with him, and there are stronger magic masters later in the game, so I feel like even with this big intelligence dip, it should balance out. Speaking to Fal, he informs us that we can indeed use him as a master, if we only fight 30 battles without resting. This is pretty easy in a regular run, and luckily it's easy here too, as just outside Genmel you'll find groups of nutfellas who all die to a single Molotov. With the Midas Stone I bought earlier, these 30 battles will give me the Zenny equivalent of 45, stocking my wallet for the next area. You can flee the 30 fights, but I really need the money, and a couple extra level ups while I'm pumping intelligence isn't gonna hurt either. I also capture 6 octopuses and 2 Martian squids. There's a lot of story busy work here, and nobody cares, so our next stop is to train a fucking soy boy into being able to fight Chad, and we'll get there through the power of a sword against an armed man. To achieve this, we'll dress him up like a warrior and humiliate him with firebombs until his skin's nice and leathery, enough to take a punch, and then we'll also rub aloe on him while the uh, buff dude is trying to score. So that goes pretty well, but you're required to supply this fucker with one piece of armor and a sword, both of which come from Ryu's equipment table. Upon returning the items, you're given upgraded versions of the gear, but they're not straight upgrades in terms of character exclusivity, they just follow a weapon and armor table. I gave this dude Ryu's armor, and he gave me back Nina's undies or something. So now I'm shit poor and Ryu's naked. Fingers crossed we won't need it as the next dungeon's short, and the boss is brutal, but also heavily exploitable. 
In the lighthouse, there's a few things to grab. We got a mini game that you can fail, and each failure costs 250 zenny, so I absolutely had to fail it. Fail it? Nail it, first try. Now it's boss time. Gazer, this giant eye held up by this small squishy green dude. The octopuses and squids I grabbed before were for this guy, because you can cast blind on him. I mean, he's a giant fucking eye, right? It also doubles his experience yield, so I use an ivory dice on him, which is an item that doubles experience, and they stack. So with file stat increases and a potential two levels for each character, when they come out of this fight, they'll be entirely different. Gazer is weak to earth and fire, which I'm packing, and he goes down very quickly. We hit the top of the lighthouse, find a new fairy friend, and we're on our way to the best part of the game. I head back to Genmel, again, grab a couple tasers, then return down under to subdue a plated mechanical Australian dolphin. Here's how you tell he's an Aussie, right? If you get up real close, you can see that his blowhole's always moving a little bit. And that's him yapping on about footy and burnouts, and that's how you know he's true blue. It's a shame that Australians are weak to electricity, Yori. Would have been more than a string of shit jokes. Now, it's time to do a cheeky sprint through a volcano, which I do, and loot a lot of things, such as fire-resistant armor for Ryu. My boy is no longer running around with his dingle dangling. I return to save after stripping the cave bare because uh, this following boss is a bit of a worry. It's two giant fireworms and a little burnt man who heals them and casts ailments on the party. Uh, turns out I stopped being a pussy and just kind of blasted through the boss with minimal issue. This is it boys, we're mere moments away from the time skip, which means we've got some preparing to do. The first thing is I loot everything in Angel Tower, then farm trickers with molotovs and dynamite. They pay out 180 zenny with the Midas Stone and can appear in up to groups of three. I grind enough money to buy a Thunder Rod in Junk Town, which is a whopping 9500 zenny, but this is a weapon which casts Jolt when used as an item, and unlike other games, weapons don't break when used. Despite being incredibly expensive, particularly for this point in the game, I now have reusable damage that costs nothing, so I'll never be poor again. Uh, but then I go to buy Wisdom Rings and realize that poverty's a cycle and Ryu isn't exactly upwardly mobile. Wisdom Rings increase intelligence by 30, and they stack, so we've got a potential 60 intelligence to gain here, but at 3000 zenny a pop, it's gonna take a lot of grinding that I don't want to do. Luckily, the Manilo store at the nearby fish and hole trades them for a couple fish, so I invest a bit of time angling and get two Wisdom Rings. I unequip a bunch of shit from Nina and Momo, since we'll be saying our farewells for just a little bit, and I might need the scrap, and then I stock up on healing and Molotovs, and we... Wait a minute. Nowhere here sells Molotovs. <laughs> oh my god! Okay, so I walk all the way back through the fire and the green steam streams to get some fucking Molotovs because I don't want to be without them. And then I walk all the way back to Angel Tower. Before completing the final part of the child's journey, I grab 3,000 zenny worth of firecrackers and move on toward the time skip. Gar is a boss here, but he's pretty weak and I would not have sex with him. Whoosh! <laughs> time skip. If Stallion is the casual filter of the child section, Dragon Zombie is that of the adult. This dude is rocking a lot of health, comes packing poison and confusion, and hits like a truck. You've only access to Ryu and Gar, and for this run, he's even tougher because I gotta deal with a lot more of him. In my first run, I get a game over as he's approaching death, which was discouraging, but the firecrackers I bought take about half his health off, and with his weakness to fire, even Gar does decent damage with Molotovs. So I chip him down slowly, but consistently. Another one of the toughest fights in the game dealt with, and Gar only counted him once. Though it was a crit for 88 damage. Fucker. The sooner we can ditch this dude, the better. Now we've got some prep work to do because I need a few items from Sin City and about 10 big ones to apprentice under the best magic master in the game, Emitai. I buy a Wind Cutter from Sin City, which is a weapon that allows me to cast Cyclone in battle and get Ryu geared up with some higher defense armor. I am now broke again, but I'm so sick of fishing and grinding. I spent half an hour fishing and fishing and barely made a grand, so I'm just going to continue the story for a bit. I visit the fairies, give them a hand getting meats and other assorted deli goods, and then try to progress, but the were tiger puts me down. I barely dealt any damage to him and he fucked me up. I don't remember the dude being this hard, but here we are. Looking back over my roster, it turns out I didn't have my defense position set, so I was taking stupid damage for no reason. Upon setting that correctly, and the mysterious Were Tiger using Focus a lot, I managed to edge out a victory. Focus is meant to double your attack power, but when used by enemies, actually decreases it to the point where his attacks that were doing 50 plus damage were now doing 7. Blessed be old video games for allowing me to progress. Now let's meet up with the gang. We meet Ray, we get Nina, and now it's time to do some sneaky shit. I really should have bought two wind cutters at Sin City, but I only bought one. This is because I can turn it into two with a simple trick. And getting Nina back allows us to execute that. 
We put a Wind Cutter in the top slot and our Thunder Rod in the second. We get into battle, have the first person use the Wind Cutter, and then have Nina equip the Thunder Rod, then we cancel all our turns. Now Nina's stinky old Magician Rod or whatever becomes a second Wind Cutter. This gives me two casts of Cyclone for the price of one. How's that for a bargain? I do a bit of monetary grinding to get the 10,000 zenny so I can apprentice everyone under Amitai, the best magic master in the game. Then we head back to Sin City, to the massacre. Everyone's bleeding and shit, it's like a tiger was let loose in here or something. Then we head to Checkpoint to find a loose tiger, and we fight a boss. Mikba is easy, most of his turns are spent poisoning us, but we can only be poisoned once, so like, half his attacks are free. With the defenses from Fahl, when he's not critting, he's doing single digit damage, and near death he does use Earthquake, which hurts a little bit more, but it's still very easy to heal around, even with Ray being permanently dead. Our little tiger's gotta keep sleeping, cause if he wakes up he goes schizo and starts doing physical attacks, and that's just not what we're about. After this, we run over to Momo, pick her and Peko up, run all the way back, apprentice him under Amitai as well. Then we head to Genmel, stocking up on the healing I'm sorely missing at this point, buy the best armor I can afford, grab another wing cutter for maximum damage output, and head back to the plant. And now I breathe. <gasps> Chugging on through with our arsenal of usable weapons, we start clearing out encounters like we're playing normally. I mean, we are technically using weapons. The plant isn't too interesting, very obtuse, and a lot of back and forthing, but we eventually come up against the first of two bosses here, the huge slug, one word. I start fighting him, he's got a huge health pool and a bad attitude, and I very quickly realise that it'll take me less time to go buy stronger attack items than it would to kill him by using the wind cutters, so I'm gonna do that. He also uses Siphon, where he absorbs your health, and that slows the fight even more, so off we go. A great change after the time skip is that Checkpoint becomes a store as well as an inn, and they sell firecrackers and icicles, which are both pretty strong attacks, you know, particularly against enemies weak to fire and ice. Between my 50 Molotovs and 17 firecrackers, I'm thinking Huge Slug's about to become Emasculated Slug. I don't think that's going to fit in the character limit. Hi, me here, from after I wrote the script, but before I recorded it, so I guess I could have written this part better. It doesn't matter. I am very stupid, which, I mean, isn't news to me and probably isn't news to you, but I did fuck up bigly here. Once you get Momo, you can return to the mines where you fought the dragon zombie to get an item called coupons. This gives you a 20% discount on every store in the game, and for some reason, I didn't do this. I was there, apprenticing them under Amitai, who is right next to the mine. Good god, this man. Anyway, back to the slug. Huge Slug isn't an issue at this point, and about halfway through starts taking significantly more damage, so he died very quickly and with minimal issue. However, he is the easier of the two bosses in the plant, because next up is Shroom. That little rant about being physically weak earlier wasn't for nothing, because this dude loves his physical damage. There's Headcracker, which does three physical hits with decent damage variants, and a bad roll will put Nina or Momo under half health. Once his second phase rolls around, he can heal himself for 200, and I only do like 30 to 40 damage a hit. So if he uses this too much, the fight is going to last much, much longer. His magics aren't too bad, as my characters have high intelligence and resist elements, though the trickles of damage don't help. Finally, his third phase is a killer, as he has a technique called Blitz. This hits everyone and does two decent sets of damage, putting everybody under half, and he loves to spam it. Two of these and it's game over, and there is nothing I can do. I run back to Sin City, grab some better armor for the girls, kill some foes along the way, and come back for another try. This one's rocky, but I somehow managed to best him. If you looked at my health, you'd think I had a good run, but at any point during his final phase, I am one bad turn from a game over, so luck was doing most of the work here. The fun doesn't stop there either. After a scuffle in Windia Castle, we gain access to the eastern parts of the world, do some more story shit, and head to the cliffs, where a gargoyle awaits. Geist is a big scary demon and must be fought against Ryu alone. He can use Risky Hit, which is a guaranteed critical if it doesn't miss, and he uses fire and stuff. This is going to be immense, as his magic resistance is through the roof, and he doesn't really have a weakness. The best you can do is ice, but the only way to get that is with icicles, and they're expensive, I'm not made of zenny. After game overing twice, doing roughly 15 damage with my Wind Cutter's Cyclone spell, I decide to liquidate all my shit at the Feces Exchange and buy icicles and cheese him. Look, he's got 2500 health, I'm not sitting for 200 turns when he can two-shot me and is faster. He can also confuse Ryu, which can lead to physical attacks being dealt, but as I didn't initiate them, and as I've carefully curtailed Ryu to do one damage, I don't think this is an issue. 
He goes down quite easy after this, as he misses most of his risky attacks, and his confusion rarely works when you've got basic protection against it. With a consistent damage output of around 100 per turn, he only took 30 turns to clap, and drops a spear worth 10,000 zenny. Sell on that, I'll make most of my money back. Thank you Geist, very based. Then Gar gets beaten up by a naked blue hair, and after some touching reunions, we head to Steel Beach to fight a big electric fish. His main gambit is poison and confuse, but my Ryu has a decent resistance, as you can see he's the only one who isn't poisoned. Despite his ailments, we're chugging along doing anywhere from 40 to 60 damage per turn, which is way better than prior encounters. Though every three turns he uses a big thunder attack which absolutely rolls Gar, a low level guy with no equipment, and keeps Ryu on his toes. Nina's immune to thunder because of a ring, but between poison and the occasional confusion, things can go south very quickly. Angler has a stupid amount of health and very little in the way of weakness. Despite this, he takes okay damage and the battle's won after a relatively uneventful skirmish. Then we have to go looking for parts to fix the ship, and I won't bore you with that, but what I will bore you with is that we pick up a robe of wind in a chest. This is significant, as it's the first piece of armor that has a usable ability. When used in battle, it casts speed, which makes you faster. It's probably not going to be too useful, but I'll keep it around just in case. Then we take our vessel out and do some sick donuts. What can I say? I'm an Australian at heart. We can also upgrade our armor at the next town, which is always a good idea, and this store sells a ruby scepter. But this wand is basically a reusable Molotov, but I don't think I'm gonna need it. It's pretty expensive, and I've got reusable weapons that outdamage the flare spell already. It's likely just a waste of money, and I hope I don't regret saying that. Anyway, there's a story mission where we gotta make some sushi for a suicidal mare, and as thanks for saving him, we get the sea chart, which allows us to access the border of a rough sea, where a legendary mariner resides. This guy's gonna tell us how to cross the ocean. The path to the mariner is finicky, but has three treasures that will make for good scrap when I sell them all, and then he gives us a lecture about some old shit, I don't know, but it ends with us having to ram a black ship from behind, so we do just that. Now we're on black ship. Can you believe that section takes like an hour? All the talking and fucking needing sushi legitimately takes like an hour. Like, I love this game, but I've got my limits. The first thing we do here is very slowly collect more treasure through this awkward crane minigame. So the idea here is that you make a path with these crates, and a lot of people would stop at the three required because it's so fucking slow. But there are actually four. If you grab the fourth, it breaks open, revealing an item, and each crate has a unique item inside, so you gotta slowly do it four times to get everything, and there's some good shit in there. An hour later, we explore the rest of Black Ship, and eventually fight the next boss, the Ammonites. These guys have a minigame before the encounter, but for the life of me, I can never make it work, and based on the many confused forum posters, nobody really knows how or if it works. If you can shuffle far enough back before the fight begins, the ship is armed with cannons that will not only attack the Ammonites for you, but will also remove their turns, since they're written as a part of the enemy's AI script. Failing that, the battle plays out like any other boss fight would, only with two bosses instead of one. At this point in the run, I'm eating Ammonites for breakfast, these guys are complete pushovers. They both have fairly low health, both are super weak to lightning, and also take a decent amount of damage from wind, which is my entire arsenal. The only potential issue is if they spam Confusion and Momo starts bazooking her friends. Ryu and Nina are both rocking a Light Bangle, which gives them a decent amount of status resistance, so they're far less likely to be confused. In hindsight, it would have been better to equip Nina's accessory to Momo, as her melee's pathetic and Momo can kill people. Ah well, we're just making strats up as we go, no biggie? I never said I was good at this game. There's also a potentially deadly technique called Tsunami, which cuts the target's health in half, but they can't really cover the other half, like there's there's not a lot of raw damage that follows, so I have ample time to heal. With a vitamin restoring 100 health and nobody having over 200, that's a full heal, and Tsunami misses more than it hits. I end up dealing around 120 to each of them per turn, and that's when Momo isn't using wind cutters and they go down with minimal effort. I think this is the first reasonably paced fight in the entire game. We've finally done it, boys. On the other side of the world, we get some armor, stock up, run around and find items and shit, the usual affair, and we do this for... I'm gonna say a good three hours before I snap and do a little fishing expedition. In the last fishing area just outside of this new world is a Manilo who wants to sell me a royal sword, the second strongest weapon in the game, which casts one of the strongest spells in the game for a couple measly fish. He wants a whale, three spearfish, and a barandy, which seems easy enough. I get a spearfish almost immediately, a whale shortly follows, and I head back to the downer region to capture a barandy. Returning to the new world, I spent like an hour trying to catch more spearfish, and they're just not letting me do it. 
Between the overly aggressive mana walls who snap up any type of bait you drop and the secret silhouettes of these horrible evil fish, I'm about to go Death Con 3 on these long nose fuckers. Okay, okay. Go on Death Con 3 worked. I got my royal sword. Though I don't have a sponsor for this video. Oh well, small price to pay. Let's give it a test. Damn, it does like double the damage of the lightning rod. Time to dupe this fucker. I bought a broadsword from McNeil and accidentally did it backwards, duping over my dagger. So my Ryu has like two more attack power. This was, uh, this was not the plan. Now, we go on to fight the next boss, Elder. Elder's usually a bit of a kick in the bum because you can't transform into a dragon, but here he's an issue because we can only use items. With the Royal Swords, we don't get much more damage than just using a Wind Cutter, but we're still dishing out a little under 100 per turn, and Elder has... 5,000 health. Great. He's fond of fire and occasionally shocks you with a little thunder, so I give Nina a Fire Ring and Momo a Thunder Ring, and we pray. Every three turns, he uses a move called Bad Back, which does nothing but makes you feel sad about the impending mortality we all face. But that's alright, because we forget about it watching 45 minute runs of Breath of Fire 3 items only. Thanks for being here still. Even though he wipes out Momo pretty early on, if we time the heal to occur during a turn with a multiple of three, it's free. So, barring a catastrophic run of bad luck or critical melee hits, this fight is a relative breeze. I do use a Devilfish at one point, which casts Molnir, doing about three times the damage of the Royal Sword. My fishing days may not be behind me just yet. Before that, however, we make our way to the Desert of Death. Wonder what we're gonna find there. This is a long, tedious section, and contains very little of interest, but there are two items of note, and some autistic king mapped a route to get the treasure and make it to the other side before your water jug runs out. David K5 on GameFAQs. Thank you, you absolute mad lad, you fucking no-life king. I love ya. The first treasure is life armor, one of the best for Ryu, and the second is another royal sword, which will give us a grand total of three. Then we go for a little walk and eventually find Manmo. This dude is a bitch, especially now that we've got three royal swords. Occasionally you'll get clapped by a cheeky confusion, but he's very quick to slap you out of your funk with his giant meat fists. Nina has a little sleep, then we awake and waddle on over to Kaya Zan. Ka Kaya Kaya Zan? Kaya Zan. Kaya Zan? I, I've got no idea to pronounce this, but I gave it a good fucking go. We head to the store, buy two Brass Knuckles, which allow me to cast Samoon, a basic fire-wind combo spell, and grab three Force Armors. Ryu doesn't really need one, but it certainly bulks Nina and Momo, and if you use them in battle, they cast Barrier on one ally. Barrier is a technique which raises magic defense, and it's gonna help me greatly as there are only three major bosses remaining, but they, they fucking love their magic. Knowing that the final stretch is before me, I'm feeling a little lacking in the damage department. You know, sure, three royal swords is pretty good, but if I'm gonna go out, I want it to be with a bang. A big bang, like a lightning bolt cast by a god, or explosives used in a war. You know, something that's gonna kill a lot of people. The entire adult portion of the game has been spent cultivating by Fairy Village to produce napalm, which isn't exactly hard, but the fact that I had foresight over anything is a miracle. But the Fairy Village is an optional side event that you can participate with, wherein you manage the construction of a small town and effectively dictate services and goods they can provide. I made them open five shops until one randomly sold Napalm. Mastermind. I quickly switch masters back to Fahl, the defense and health guy, then I go and cast a line for more Devilfish. They're pretty hard to catch and their spawn rate's low, so I settle on about 15 and we head back to face our first boss in the Myria station, Chimera. Fuck this dude, he's got a shitload of health, hits like a truck, has a wide array of spells, and has a unique attack that only he uses called Paralyzer. This stops a character from moving, can't be prevented, and can only be healed after it's already inflicted. It's like a powered up version of Paralysis. He's also got a disturbingly high chance of using this attack. Once he's down past half health, he stops using it so much and focuses on elemental magic, which we're pretty resistant to with our elemental rings and high intelligence, so my goal is to rush him to halfway. He doesn't have any major resistances himself, so my Devilfish do high 200s and Napalm does a low 200, which is insane considering how we got to this point. Eventually, he hits the halfway point. After a few close calls and chasing Momo's almost perpetual paralysis, he starts casting Molnir, which is great because it does bugger all damage and Ryu has a Thunder Ring. We keep moving forward and praying for no physical attacks, which do well over half our health. Eventually, he starts casting a healing spell, which means he's nearly dead. I run out of Devilfish and keep the Napalm spam on until he finally falls. 
I only got one game over to this, and honestly that's surprising. I would consider Chimera the toughest boss in the game, solely because of his ability to paralyze through status resistances, and as far as I know, no other enemy can do that. Strong as he may be, we're not out of harm's way just yet. We've got one more major boss right in front of us. D-Lord. The D stands for Dominic. He's about to give us a spicy keychain we won't soon forget. I gotta take Ray with me, but I'm running from everything anyway, so it's no biggie. Next thing we know, we're given a lecture about why genocide's cool from a familiar fellow, then we get sucked into our own mind to fight a skeleton demon dog. He's not a real boss, he's a fake, a pretendo, one might say. He's fought with a solo Ryu and has a physical attack, sleep, and can cast ice spells. I give Ryu an ice resist shield, status resist amulet for the sleep, and alternate between doing 30 damage per turn and healing when necessary. With a decent 2400 health, we are here for a very long time. After this, we break free from our mind prison to encounter the purplest dragon you've ever seen today in this video. This is Dragon Lord, the penultimate boss. He starts with a triple strike, which would have killed Nina in one shot, if not for the fact that one of those hits missed. From here, we start laying on the napalm, and I burn through a few devil fish I caught. I regret not doing more fishing, but hey, that's life. I load up everyone with fire protection gear as he's quite fond of flames, but also uses ice magic, so I use the force armors to cast barrier on each character once, reducing magic damage. Ryu cops a triple strike and can only take one, just as Momo. As long as Nina doesn't get hit, we should be fine. The physical attacks are killing me, but I negate most of his magic, even when he starts casting Sirocho, one of the stronger spells. After a long, tedious, but equally stressful fight, this giant bastard goes down. My inventory is almost empty, I'm completely demoralized, and a little bit bored, but there's only one major obstacle in my way now. The final boss, goddess of the birdcage, Miria. Before that, however, there are two important things to do. The first is to restock my inventory as I'm low on everything, and the second is a gauntlet of boss refights before the final boss. This is mostly optional, but I want the experience and the zenny, so I'm gonna take it. I clean out the bosses, you've seen them all before, but I'm significantly stronger now. I do a long tedious run back to the mainland to stock up on everything. I'm gonna need all the cash I can get, so I slowly and methodically cut through every random encounter I find, but not before I take a moment to do some fishing. After a lot of narrative events, we finally arrive at the ultimate boss, the big girl herself, my snake demon blonde haired g bird goddess Miria. Status ailment resistance is a must for this fight, as Miria comes packing, everything from poison to paralysis, and her first phase is ailment oriented. Given that our resistance is high, she only hits us for actual damage maybe once or twice during this whole section, in which I dump the 20 or so devilfish I got pre-fight, dealing just shy of 5000 damage. This is a quarter of her health, and the fight will chug along until she gets below half, so we've got a while to go, especially now that I'm using napalm, which does about half the damage of devilfish. She's quite fond of using Sanctuary, a technique that dispels buffs and power-ups, so I'm not going to use those yet. We move along until she eventually drops below half, and at this point, shit gets real. She no longer uses Sanctuary, so I can give myself a barrier buff to lower magic damage and even buff my speed if I feel the need. This makes me feel a little more secure, because she also gains an attack called Holocaust, which does huge damage and inflicts a bunch of ailments. Also, YouTube better not pick that word up and be like, Ooh, he said the naughty thing. Fuck you. It's perfectly harmless. Unless you're the subject of it. <laughs> we get a fairly bad start, with her immediately casting a healing spell, which is fairly uncommon, so that's just fucking dandy. Let's make this fight last longer than it has to, yeah. At this point, I'm waiting for a genocide, burning through my rapidly dwindling napalm stack. She continues to spam restore, which is really, really bad. I need to napalm her down to a third phase, as under a quarter health, she stops using it. If I run out of napalm, I can't outdamage it, and given how unlucky I've been so far, that would mean a game over. The first holocaust is up, and it deals about 30 damage. Okay, as long as I can get it at under 5000 health, this fight's pretty much ours. It's just gonna take a really, really long time. After another tedious 5000 health, we hit the final stretch, and I find this out in brutal fashion, as Momo gets clapped by a death spell. Ouch. 
we bounce back nicely and heal Momo up, then Miria resorts to spamming Holocaust as we run out of Napalm. So now we're doing 60 damage a pop with the Royal Sword while we, while we pray for no death casts. The only way we can lose here is if Miria hits a death and we can't get the victim back on their feet fast enough to recover before we experience another loss. There's plenty of time left for it to happen as we're only doing 180 damage per turn if we don't have to heal and she's got a good 30 or so turns left in her. Luckily, she spammed Venom so many times and we're highly resistant to poison. Between that and the excess amount of genocide she tried to cause, which did like 30 damage to each of my dudes, the fight was nowhere near as bad as I thought it'd be. Well, that's it. Breath of Fire 3 with items only. Can it be done? Yes, with some prior game knowledge and careful pre-planning, it's actually not that difficult. Should it be done? No, it doubles game time and obscures half the cool shit, such as dragon transformations. Why did I do it? That's a great question. See you next time for more pain.